Uh, thank you all for uh, making time to come today. I don't even know where my notes are. Let's make sure I follow the recipe. Um, firstly, the acknowledgement of country. We recognise the um, traditional owners and Aboriginal um, custodians of the lands on which we move, especially the Woolgaroo, Kabar and Bindal people, and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, also, if you want to meet with any of our visiting researchers, there's an opportunity this afternoon um, from three o'clock. They'll all be based in the meeting room in building 32, so room 114 in the other building. Just, just pop your head in there and grab them and then go take them for a coffee or whatever you want to do. I've long, long realised I'm not a good secretary, so I've given up trying to schedule everyone's time this afternoon. But if you've already got an email from me, go at that a lot of time, a lot of time. Otherwise, just go and grab those guys when you need to. Also, if you want to meet them in a more informal session, we're meeting at the Riverview Tavern from 5 p.m. this afternoon. So please come down and join us there if you if you um, want to have a beer by the river this afternoon. So it's my pleasure now to introduce um, Professor Michael Berriman. Um, he's an alumni of James Cook University. He completed his PhD in 2007, looking at the life histories and feeding ecology of butterfly fish with myself, Howard Choate, and also Jeff Jones, who's an apology today because he's marking honest um, seminars. So after um, Michael did his postdoc at Woods Hole, he was one of the founding faculty members at um, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, where he's been for the last 13 years. He's now the director of House Red Sea Research Centre, and um, I'm extremely grateful that he's able to make the time to commit to um, the workshop that we're running this week in the centre, looking at the effects of um, coral loss and reef degradation on reef fishes. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Michael. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, sorry for the delay, um, but you know how it goes. And um, also thanks to Morgan and everybody who's helped organize, um, especially Inga and Victor for putting up with me being very late and sending information. Uh, so anyway, I thought uh, I'll try to speed it up and um, get very quickly some of the messages I wanted to share. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Red Sea. I see some familiar faces and there's some of you have been there and there's some of you have not. So um, I'll just try to give you a little overview about some things we're up to at Kaus. Um, this is where the university is located, and it is um, in the central Red Sea. And there are, um, you know, it's, a, it's a relatively large basin. So we have a couple thousand. Saudi Arabia has almost 2,000 kilometers of coastline, almost all of which has reef along the along the shore. And there's also reef on the other side as well. So it's a really interesting place to be for a reef person. And prior to the opening of Taos, it was rather difficult to get into most parts of the Red Sea in terms of scientific access. So this is the university. Um, this is our campus. We, we live and work there. This is a residential university for all the international staff. And um, I just put this picture up just to show that we really are right on the coast and there's a large network of reefs very nearby. So we can access, um, we can access about three dozen reefs from day books that leave from the university. So it's a little bit like a combination of the field station and the university. So um, it Cal's just, it's a, we only have uh, what we call postgrads. So we only have masters and PhD students. We don't have any undergraduate students, which means no undergraduate teaching. Um, and the real, very heavy focus on research. It is an international university that um, we have only about 40% Saudi students. Uh, and in fact, in marine science, that number is even lower because um, we're able to attract a lot of international students. So in marine science, we're probably 90% international students. Um, this is not supposed to be up. Let's skip this one. Um, well, we're not, uh, yeah, so well, we teach in English. I don't think that's relevant for you to know. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the habitats that are, um, uh, uh, major areas of focus include the shallow water coastal systems like mangroves, seagrasses, and especially uh, coral reefs. So we did work in almost all the habitats of the Red Sea, including the deepest parts of the Red Sea, uh, shallow bottom habitats, open water habitats, um, but the, especially the nice pictures come from the shallow ones, so I put that up there. Um, here's Hugo. For those of you who know Hugo, uh, Hugo likes to come over and use our molecular facility uh, we have uh, really good equipment, really fun toys. 
And so uh, it's a, I think it's a really great combination of having um, you know, brand new world-class facilities on land and really good access to the coastal sites nearby. Um, one of the things, I mean, I loved my time here at JCU, but it was, as most of you know, rather difficult to get out to most of the sites, even if it's not that far away. So that's been a, a lot of fun. Morgan you mentioned um, that I've been the director of the Red Sea Research Center at CALS for a few years. Um, we have, from the very beginning of CALS, we have a major focus on marine biology. These are all the professors in our center. So um, what my big job as the center director has been to add all of this extra component that we want to have a much, much larger focus on marine science, let's say one is marine biology. So we're trying to bring in, there's a lot of geologists very interested in the activities of the Red Sea, um, but things like robotics and sensors and artificial intelligence, um, the, what, what I hope I'll have time to cover at the very end is that the challenges and pressures that are coming on the Red Sea, that the, that the sea is facing, are really much, much more than just biology problems today and certainly will be in the future. So we've been trying to recruit a large number of other areas of research to apply their skills to the Red Sea environment. Uh, a lot of these people are not marine scientists at all, but we've convinced them to apply their expertise into marine problems. Um, but one of, most of what I'm gonna show you today um, comes from uh, my lab and the, the Regicology lab. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that um, I rarely do much of this work myself anymore. It's really all the students, postdocs, the staff, et cetera. And I did want to highlight a handful of people who have had JC connections. Many of you probably know Darren Coker, who's there mm -hmm. hiding in the back, and then a couple of others. We, we always have uh, reasonable ties with JCU in terms of people who've been here or come through here. Um, so in our group, we have um, a few different types of research interests that I generally put them into these four categories. We're really interested in biodiversity studies. We have a lot of effort looking at um, adult movements. This is a, a very, very important collaboration that started here at JCU with Jeff and um, Maya and Hugo and a long, long list of other people working on larval dispersal and connectivity. And I will always have a special place in my heart for the butterfly fish, thanks to Morgan. And um, so we still like to play around with them sometimes. Um, but just a little background about the Red Sea, because it is a pretty, um, I think it's a pretty unique environment. It is quite warm all the time, um, but what this is supposed to illustrate is the gradient. So it gets much cooler in the north than it is in the south. And there's a counter gradient of salinity, so it's very salty almost everywhere in the Red Sea, but especially as you go from the north, you get to about 41 ppb or whatever you want to, ppt, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it's it's always salty, but it's especially salty in the north. And productivity is very low, except in the south. The Red Sea is only connected to the Indian Ocean um, through a fairly narrow stretch down here at the south. And we'll talk more about that a bit later. But um, most of the oceanographic properties of the Red Sea are driven by the fact that there's only this connection. I mean, there is the Gulf of the Suez Canal, but oceanographically, it, is, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't really exist. So there's no rivers, there's no freshwater input into the Red Sea. But on the very odd occasions that it rains somewhere, we get a little bit of local runoff, but there's no permanent rivers and probably have never been for the approximately 5 million year history of the Red Sea. So that sets up a pretty interesting environment for the biology. Um, but I mentioned the temperature, um, and I showed that earlier figure. This is a, just a, I wanted to show you, this, that, those are winter temperatures. This is winter uh, from a year in 2008, where you can see that it's cold in the north of the Red Sea at about 23, 24 degrees, um, which for those of us adapted to these conditions, it's absolutely miserable, and we would avoid diving in those conditions. Um, but even in the winter in the south, where um, it's a bit warmer, it's in the 30s, but this was a few months later in the summer, where it's, so it's routinely 32, 33, 34 degrees, um, and that's just normal. If you get on top of a reef flat and at the end of a hot day without, without much wind, it's, it's very common to see 36 or 37 degrees. So those types of conditions, high salinity, high temperature, um, we, we have a lot of people who are 
interested in looking at this, the Red Sea as a potential model system, kind of mirroring what some of the forecasts for global climate change mean the rest of the world's oceans will look like, because there are quite healthy marine systems there. And so uh, we can look at those and try to understand if there's something uh, we can take away from that. Now, to illustrate another point that I haven't mentioned yet, um, one of our studies, we tagged a bunch of whale sharks, um, working with um, people from Woods Hole before the university opened, we discovered an aggregation of whale sharks in um, a bit south of the big city of Jeddah. And so we started tagging these animals, they went all over the Red Sea, but you can see that they favor the central and southern part of the Red Sea. And if you remember the productivity slide, this is the only place that things like whale sharks would find more food. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. Uh, some of these tags measure properties as the animals dive. And so we could see the animals doing very deep dives, um, more than a thousand meters. The cut, the, this is time, and each bar is a day where we have information. And the color represents the temperature of the water where the animal was. So the feature that you want to notice here is that even at a thousand meters depth in the Red Sea, <clears throat> it's never colder than 21 degrees. So this is very unique that it's warm in the Red Sea, but it never gets cold, even if you go really deep. The deepest part has got 3,000 meters, 21 degrees. So that has super interesting implications for people who want to study deep water organisms, deep water corals, um, which, which we have plenty of. And so um, it's really an interesting body of water. This is an animal that was um, in the, and, and just to clarify, we did not discover that with these animals. This has long been known that the Red Sea is warm. Um, I think it's generally just overlooked in most deep water, you know, sort of theoretical and, and biology studies, so just kind of ignored that this is happening. Um, anyway, so this was another, a different shark, but this was one that actually left the Red Sea. And so as soon as she was outside of the Red Sea and she's doing the same diving pattern, we can see the water temperature is now in the low teens, which is what we expect anywhere in the world when we go to a thousand meters. So that, just wanted to set up how interesting or unusual or weird the Red Sea is in terms of those features. And then, um, you know, I've already mentioned that there's all these healthy, uh, reasonably healthy habitats there. And so the, the interesting outcome of that is that there's very high rates of endemism. And in almost every group of organisms, when you look, you find that there are um, endemic species, I mean, only found in the Red Sea. Um, and we're pretty certain that a lot of that has to do with adapting to these tough conditions and adapting to these um, extremes. So just to show you a few pretty pictures and another, you know, the beautiful butterfly fish. Um, this was, by the way, the first reef fish for which a genome was sequenced. Um, the beautiful rats. These are all pictures by Tane. Those of you know Tane uh, Sinclair Taylor. Our, our, our Nemo is endemic. The Red Sea uh, clown fish is endemic. Um, some cool, cool fish. And, and just one more butterfly fish for more. <laughs> An acrophore specialist. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, the um, the there are a lot of species for which uh, we don't actually have very much biological information, and uh, so one thing that we spent a lot of time on, especially in, in recent years, is trying to get fundamental life history data. And thank you, Professor Cho, for all the years of indoct indoctrinating me with how important it is to have these things. But what really surprised us was to find out that when we started working in Saudi that even the the government, no, nobody has this information for most of the fisheries target species. So that produces huge complications in developing reasonable management plans and uh, all that kind of basic things that I, I really took for granted how much information is known in a well-studied system. And um, even things like the most targeted grouper, electrophone like species, uh, we didn't know anything about it. So I'm just gonna jump ahead a little bit to talk about some of the, the biogeography and biodiversity patterns. So the, the first thing I have to say is that there was so little information about the main part of the Red Sea in terms of biodiversity that we ended up having to spend a surprising amount of time doing some fundamental biodiversity work in order to then scale it up to biogeographic patterns. So early in the days of KAUS, we organized 
several expeditions where we would um, try to find various taxonomic experts from around the world, bring them over, put them on a liveaboard boat, and say, all right, we're going to take you to this area, just dive, do your thing, find your whatever, shrimps, sponges, crabs, all that fun stuff, and then bring it back, tell us what it, tell us what it is, and we start to put together some pictures of the patterns. So um, especially if you're interested in endemism, you need to know boundaries of where things occur, which means you need to go a lot of places. And so um, we did not have to, it's probably like a legal disclaimer I have to make if anybody at council is listening. Um, we did not personally go to all of these places. Some of these are very interesting, um, this is just a very interesting parts of the world to work in. And so we often rely on collaborators and local partners that can help either do sampling or get us samples or get us data. Uh, because it is, it is very tricky, especially right now, to go to places like in. Um, so, but um, yeah, it's, been, it's taken a lot, a lot of effort to build up samples and um, sampling patterns like this, but um, it's also been a lot of fun exploring. So some of the, I'll just show a few quick highlights and some examples of things that have happened. You can find books um, for the fish that describe ranges, and you can find um, species lists and things from the Red Sea, which have a name for the fish. And then upon closer examination, we've often found that uh, what is in the Red Sea is different. And so we do this, I'm skipping through the some of the details here, but we really like to employ a combination of traditional molecular, uh, traditional morphological taxonomic approach with the heavy sequencing that we do, or even sometimes the simple sequencing is very clear. So we try to combine the morphology and the, and the molecular work to see, you know, to really confirm species identities. So this is one that Michelle Gaither and Jack Randall had their eye on, and uh, once they were able to get some samples out of the Red Sea, they were quite, it was very clear, very, very obvious quickly that the Red Sea one had the wrong name, so it got a new name. And um, we had an, another endemic species in the fish list. This is one that Howard was looking at from the very, very first trip. Whenever uh, we went, um, Howard didn't come with us on that trip, but he sent us, and he sent me and Phil and Cormac and Jeff all separate messages demanding that somebody get a tissue of the Red Sea Pestiliferous, because he had his doubts. And so Pestiliferous is described from, you know, this, this part of the world, or is, is known to be here, but the fish in the Red Sea had this name, and for many, many years, it was called Pestiliferous. And just to jump ahead, and some work, especially very convincing work by Kai and Ma, a JCU PhD student, uh, showed that this thing, the Red Sea Plectroponus, has absolutely nothing to do with this one, I think it's about 10 million years diverged. Is that right, Howard? It's, it's very, very distant. There's really no connection. So we have yet another Red Sea endemic. And then I go back to, especially for this fish, the point I made earlier that we had zero life history information. We didn't know anything about its age, its maturity. And yet it was, it is still the most valuable fish in the fishery. So it's pretty shocking. And one of my very first master's students' project was to do the life history of that um, of that species, and then I I didn't get the picture in here. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> we, have a, we have a new uh, a brand new species just from uh, I think the paper was published a, a week or two ago. Um, but the fun story about a vice president from Taos, who's not a he's a he's a physics guy. But he liked to fish, and he was fishing in the mangroves around Taos, caught a bream that in the pagris that he thought looked a little bit different than the one that was in the book. And he brought it, we sequenced it, and sure enough, it was a new species. So it's just been named after his mother, and uh, who was a botanist. So uh, I can send you, Kaus did a little video about this on feature of the VP. Um, I guess the fun part of the story is that he caught it. He, he, he sent me a WhatsApp message. I said, yeah, you have a, can I get a piece of the tissue? He gave me a fin clip. And I gave it to the guys in the lab who sequenced it. And I got I got a message which said the subject line of the email was, I hope the VP didn't eat that fish. <laughs> to which I sent uh, I sent the VP a message and he said, Yeah, I ate it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
But I can give you more, no problem, just be aware and have a question. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the very similar Acanthopagus species uh, was described 250 years ago, 1770 something. Um, so how is it possible that for this long, a species that sits right on the coast is probably very easily caught in that area. Um, you know, how, is it, how did it escape scientific notice for so long? And I think the answer is that this particular species only lives in the mangroves, and the fishermen never go in the mangroves. The similar Acanthopagus species ventures out into the reefs, and that's where the fishermen do their fishing. So all the fishing in Saudi and most of the Red Sea is coral reef fish. So things that don't go out onto reefs may have the same limits like that. So anyway, other fun discoveries. Um, many of you know Francesca Benzoni, who is a, a coral guru. And uh, Francesca's um, long been in love with the Red Sea, starting with her master's work at Vienna. And so she's just moved to Cal a couple of years ago as a professor. And um, she's discovered all kinds of fun things like a new, a new genera of possible corded corals. So she's in the process of working this up right now. Um, those of you familiar with the corals know that this is an extremely common genera and it's a genus, and so to um, our family. So to have a new genus in this group is pretty special. And uh, Francesca is also, I don't have photos, and she would kill me if I maybe even for saying this, but she's also been doing some deeper work, collections from deeper parts of the Red Sea. And just on one expedition in the last couple of months, she found absolutely certain she has three new families of coral. So the point that I'm trying to make is that there's a lot of discovery to be done. And others, Francesca, and um, our, our good invertebrate friend, no, he's not invertebrate, our good friend and invertebrate expert, <laughs> Gustav, Gustav Pollack from the Florida Museum of Natural History. We work a lot with Gustav on, on some of our other invertebrates. Uh, some of you know Jess Bomeister. She's uh, she was uh, one of my early PhD students, and her project she was going to be looking at um, uh, coral spawning. She wanted to look at acropora spawning, and uh, she realized that she was having a lot of trouble identifying the species based on whatever guides were available. And so she said, "I think I need to look closely at some of these species." One of the things she said was, "I need a basket." I said, "All right, get a basket." I did not know, and I still don't want to know if IKEA knows that, that they were involved in this work. Uh, probably not, but Jess, doing her thing, swimming around, uh, came across this cypastria, which she thought looked a little bit funny. Um, it's got, it, it looks very, very good for a cypastria, except for the number of septa. It's weird. So being a good student, she collected a piece of it. She brought it back to the lab, and um, that was uh, that got the name of Kaus. So that species was described with the name Kaus. And um, so uh, Tulia, who did a joint PhD with JCU and Kaus, Tulia uh, also was you know doing her thing and found an interesting coral. And um, I don't know if you speak Italian here. Oh, okay, sorry. Well, so the, the species name comes from the Italian word for unexpected. Because she was looking in the microscope, she thought she had um, a leptoceris, and upon examination of the microscope, it was very obviously a pachycerus. And so that's why well, her first thing she said was, oh, and so that's the name of that species. So, all right, sorry. It's been too long, all that. If we're finding new species of fish and new species of corals on a pretty regular basis, imagine how much unknown diversity there is in all the other groups. And uh, it, it's it, for sure in the work we've had with the various taxonomists, we're I think now in the high hundreds numbers of species for which we're sure we have something new. It will take forever for these things to work their way through the taxonomic publication process. but. We know that there's a lot of unknowns. So how do we use all of that information? And so I mentioned that we wanted to really kind of examine these patterns of, for example, endemism. And so this is from a review that um, of, of data that Joey DiBattista put together. Um, but you can look at corals or fish for the other groups. It's hard to find groups with enough data to do this exercise. But we tried with annelids and we tried with crustaceans. And what you can see is that 
the the Red Sea is always quite high in the region for in endemism, and the, the Arabian Gulf is also. But if you look at species richness, it's a another interesting pattern where we start to see that the, the Arabian Gulf is always a, a reduced species diversity, and the Red Sea remains quite high. So the Red Sea is uh, it's an interesting place if you're if you want to study biodiversity. And if you're wanting to take your hand at finding a new species, just come and you know, dig through some rubble and probably you'll find something new. So, but why is that happening? What makes the you know what makes it interesting for the Red Sea? And um, Howard has spent a lot of time with us and Joey debating and discussing some of these things. So I'll just kind of summarize where we stand with the argument. Was the Red Sea ever completely cut off? So um, one hypothesis is that through various glacial maxima, that opening of the south of the Red Sea may have been cut you know, dry, may have, have become completely locked. Um, we don't actually think that that's the case, but it would have been close and there would have been very limited circulation. But with those patterns of sea level going up and down, uh, there are opportunities for species to invade the Red Sea, to move into the Red Sea, and then maybe did they diversify, did they get cut off? Were, was it possible that through some of those low sea level periods where without a doubt the Red Sea would have gotten quite even more salty, um, did somehow some species survive that? And so um, what Joey did was he applied um, particular types of molecular analyses to certain species to see if we could date those, the date since those Red Sea populations last if you have genetic contact with the Indian Ocean populations. And this chart just shows the um, various models of the sea level, the sea level, um, the sea level. Uh, zero is today, and the, the biggest drop is about 120 meters. Um, the depth of that opening at the southern end of the Red Sea is about 135 meters. So that's why we don't think it was ever completely cut off, but it would have been quite isolated. Um, and the, the biggest one is this is the last you know, 20,000 years ago, the last big ice age. So, all right. So we can find some examples of some species which are own, look, look like recent invaders of the Red Sea. So um, Morgan was discussing Kitadon Mariga in our workshop earlier today. So it's a recent arrival into the Red Sea. Um, and you can see, so, so they fit the pattern of having only come in after this last glacial maxima. However, we can find other species which actually date back much further. And so these species had to stay inside and isolated in the Red Sea even through this um, really low sea level period. And um, those tend to correspond with other major level, uh, major changes in sea level. So they could have been doing something different just at an earlier time. But we also find some species which have been isolated in the Red Sea for nearly a million years. So those species are, I mean, even actually this, this has then subsequently been analyzed and our pipe of life is in the Red Sea is almost certainly different species from the Indian Ocean one. We haven't formally described it yet, but um, that means that they've been through some pretty crazy conditions somewhere inside the Red Sea. Maybe they found little pockets where there wasn't such crazy uh, salinity. It, it's a, an ongoing question about figuring out how that all happened. But um, so this is helping us kind of understand what, what's been going on. Uh, so, spoiler is that we don't know the answer to why are there so many species in the Red Sea. There are lots of different <coughs> hypotheses, and if you have a reasonable hypo hypothesis, we can probably find a species which fits that pattern. And of course, most of them are not mutually exclusive, right? So, what, what affected some species didn't necessarily have to affect all the others. And so, um, what we're maybe thinking about, we've got a few people at CALS to work on very large scale, very um, high resolution models. And um, we're thinking about maybe trying to do some time casting and looking at these former uh, climatologies and former conditions to see if maybe certain species, if we play with, if we play with various parameters in the model, 
for example, maybe one species has a very subtly different salinity tolerance in its larval stage than another species. And maybe that's enough to explain why it wasn't able to come into the Red Sea for you know, 100,000 years when a very, very similar species did. Uh, I think that's one of the things that's very hard to understand is that you can look at endemic species compared to wide ranging species from the same genus, even maybe the same you know, subgenus or something. And as far as we can tell, they're basically doing the same thing, ecologically, by history, by all the, all the characters look really similar. And for some reason, one is endemic and one makes it all the way happily to, from the Red Sea to Hawaii without any, without any apparent genetic break in the population. So we're trying to figure out if there are ways to play at this question. Um, there have been, um, you know, I think Jeff and Julie and Kaylee's work on endemism and rare species have been super interesting. And there are probably a lot of good ideas that we could be testing and playing around with looking at some of these comparative species in the Red Sea. Then there are some hardcore genomics people in Taos that are getting very excited about the possibility of doing some really good genomic comparisons to start looking for this. Now, this actually is much more applicable, I think, for the coral people, where um, the, the question that is being asked is, are there unique genes that may be in some of these genomes that are related to heat stress tolerance or other types of stress tolerance? And if we can find those genes or modules of genes, can we do something with that? All right, and I'll stop short of the Jurassic Park scenarios and <laughs> genetically engineering things around the world. But uh, the first question is, can we even find such types of genes? So who cares about any of that stuff? Um, well, I know you're all scientists that appreciate this type of information, um, but uh, we're, <laughs> I sometimes have to explain why the rest of the, anyone else should care about this. Um, so, uh, I mentioned that one of the very first things we had to do was catalog um, what was in the Red Sea. And I mentioned some of the biodiversity work, but I didn't tell you anything about the very first trip we ever did was uh, Simon Thorold from Woods Hole, my boss at the time was organizing, so we had Phil, Mark, Kathy came along, Jeff is here, so it's Steve Neal, and we had this um, team to come and survey the reefs through the Red Sea. The short message of all of that work for several years was the reefs looked really good, the corals looked really good, the structure looked good, but there were no big fish. So where were all the fish? And um, it took a few years before I was able to get over to Sudan to go survey, do the same types of surveys in Sudan. And this is a relatively common site in Sudan. You can spend years diving in Saudi and never ever see a shark. Um, and so we have some grubs fans in here. So I thought I would show some of our grubs data. <laughs> if we show, if we look at grubs from the from the central and northern Red Sea, uh, your number of sharks per hour is basically zero. And the coolest things we see are things like more eels. Uh, if we then go down to the far south of the Red Sea, okay, technically we see some Uh These are not real sharks. So they're not real. <laughs> And then we got to Sudan, and there, there we're seeing shark all the time. We're seeing sharks, so there's a very big contrast, which really then convinced me that the problem um, is a fishing problem. Uh, this is some. It's an interesting paper if you want to see more about that. But um, it'll just point out if we look at the, the predators, the red bars are the abundances of biomass uh, of a few select top predators or predators are predatory fish, and the green bars are the Saudi bars. So the reefs, we cannot tell a difference. You know, all the multivariate stats are, the reefs look the same. The biomass of predators is much, much higher in Sudan. Again, I'm pretty sure it's a fishing problem. This is a typical view of a small town fish market in, uh, the, in the Saudi coast. And there's your giant uh, Petropomus. Um, I didn't put the number, but in that first survey, survey series we did with Jeff, we counted 300,000 fish on 50 reefs or so, about 50 reefs that we surveyed. And we saw four plectropomas, two of which were about this big, <laughs> two which were normal adult size. And then every day you go to the fish market, you're going to see dozens of them. So they have a serious fishing problem. And so, the, the, as I mentioned, if you, if you 
think about all the unknown biodiversity and all the other groups. The management situation, there's, I, I said this diplomatically since I think I'm being reported. There's a lot of opportunity for improving the situation. <laughs> and I think that because the reef quality looks the same and because the Sudanese reefs still have these very healthy populations, I really do think that if they get in place some very simple basic management plans, like we've modeled and, and our genetic data suggests that there's zero problem with almost any species connecting from the Sudanese reefs to resupply the Saudi side. So I think that there's lots of good reasons for optimism. And couldn't, couldn't not mention a couple of projects that are happening in the Red Sea at the moment. This is uh, one called the Red Sea Project. It's, uh, this is a very unique feature in the Red Sea. It's about 100 kilometers of coastline that has a very large barrier reef creating a lagoon. It's about 40, 50 meters deep in this lagoon. There is not another feature in the Red Sea like this. <laughs> And all of these islands um, are attracted the attention of a major government project to build um, a resort. And so this is called the Red Sea Project, and they're going to develop several of these islands. Um, but this project is also the phrase, it's regenerative, regenerative tourism. So they are, they have plans, that they are sure that they're going to improve the environment. Um, not only protect it, but they're actually going to improve it through their plans. Um, but part of their plans are introducing some fishing here, and that might actually that might actually work. So uh, the big one is something called neon, and I cannot do this justice. I see some laughs, so I know who's seen some of the YouTube videos. <laughs> if you haven't, they're all about a minute long. There are. <clears throat> They're worth checking out. <laughs> there are some really interesting plans for Neon, the city of the future. So right now, uh, in this region in the far north, so this is the Gulf of Aqaba, the very far north of the Red Sea. This is, it's huge. I think they say it's half the size of Belgium or something like that. So it's gonna be a, a, not, not a city, it's more like a country, it's several large cities planned. Um, but this is also, the, right now there's almost zero infrastructure in this area, there's a few small towns. Uh, but they're planning you know, crazy, crazy cities in the future. The one that you need to check out the most recently is something called the Line. This is going to be a 500-meter-high building that runs 170 kilometers straight across the, the coast here. Um, so it's, uh, like I said, you just need to go watch their video. <laughs> it's very interesting. We, so we, our CALS, our relationship with both of these big projects is to try to provide as much science as we can to make sure that, uh, to give them the best chance they have to do this without huge environmental impacts. But I will wrap it up there and say thanks very much to Morgan and again, Victor and Inga for helping organize and the team, whoever ultimately rescued the system today. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. Uh, I will be around, as Morgan said, this afternoon, and uh, we'd love to chat more. And that's it. So I'll stop there. Thank you.